What is going on, Raider Nation? It's your boy Sanji back at it with another video. Today, we are talking about the winners and losers from that Las Vegas Raiders for San Francisco 49ers game. And I'm very, very fired up to talk about it because when you look at that game, there are guys that I think definitely showed a lot of flashes. There's guys out there that absolutely crushed it for themselves. And there are some guys that weren't that good. And we're going to talk about all of it. Let's get right into it with the biggest winner of yesterday's game. It is not who you guys think it is. Uh, this is, for me, the biggest winner of the game, and that is right tackle Dalton Wagner. The UDFA, and some people may be surprised about that one, but I want to talk about it. You know, one of the things that I think stuck out to me right away watching this guy's tape is how calm and collective he was. Saw a couple of defensive line games. This guy did not panic. He did not stress out, and he just handled it, and he picked it up, and he, he put it right to that defensive end, defensive tackle, processed the game and was just fantastic and to me when I look at a guy at the tackle position that can process games it kind of tells you mentally where they're at you know there are guys that will panic a little bit when when guys blitz when guys start to move around and they're not 100% sure what's kind of happening out in front of them that's not what we saw with Dalton Wagner yesterday his tape was very very nice to me the biggest winner of yesterday's game was Dalton Wagner and it's not just the fact that he had a good game it's the fact that the right tackle position is open and I'm not saying Dalton Wagner is going to take over the starting job. That's not what I'm saying. I think Dalton Wagner has the upside to develop into a starting right tackle. We'll talk about Thayer Munford at the end of this video as we kind of get to it. But I think Thayer Munford didn't have as great of a game. He really didn't look like he took that year to leap, at least from what I've seen so far. Plus, with Jermaine Illuminar, we're not sure if he's going to be here, right? There's already been rumors that the guy's not coming back next season. Um, which doesn't mean anything. There's just rumors, right? It's not official, but I do think Illumina is going to end up starting once again this year. And I think Dalton Wagner could be the long-term right tackle option. So I think he's a fantastic find for the Raiders. You know, we're able to bring him in. He's nasty. He's tough. He's physical. He has that richy incognito mindset to want to whoop your ass and he finishes, right? So to me, that's the guy that I'm really, really excited for. And we'll be doing a film breakdown on him a little bit later on. Let's go ahead and get into the next winner. We got Aiden O'Connell. Let's just be honest here. Aiden O'Connell is him. And what's crazy about O'Connell is not only did he surpass my expectations, 15 of 18, 83.3% completion percentage, 141 yards and a touchdown. He had two other touchdown drives and a one where we were able to kick a field goal. The guy looked very calm and poised in the pocket. And we did a film breakdown on him earlier uh, on this channel. And the thing is, when you watch this guy, he he gives you those Tom Brady type vibes. And I'm not saying he's Tom Brady. Don't don't get it twisted. What I'm saying is this guy is cool. He's collective. He's poised in the pocket. He doesn't panic when there's pressure and, and he doesn't get happy feet. He's not looking to run. The guy's going to throw the football. And it'll be interesting to see how he kind of handles when he gets hit or when he plays a good defensive line. And I mentioned that in the film breakdown as well. I really want to see how he kind of progresses. And another thing to keep in mind is, yes. It was against backups in the very first preseason, no scheme involved. All of that is true, but it still looked good, right? And to me, Aiden O'Connell has a little bit of upside, right? And he wasn't out there with Devontae Adams. He wasn't out there with Hunter Renfro. He wasn't out there with, you know, the, the first string unit on the offensive line. But what he showed us was a guy that can get it done with the guys kind of around him. Keep in mind, 15 of 18, two of those uh, three incompletions were drop passes by Trey Tucker. So I'm excited for Aiden McConnell as he develops. We got another winner here. This one's a guy who I'm really, really high on, but he just hasn't been able to uh, perform. That is Malcolm Koontz. I think Malcolm Koontz did a really good job yesterday. There were two plays that led to sacks that were 100% caused by Malcolm Koontz. Um, yesterday, I think the Raiders had five total sacks. A couple of them, Malcolm Koontz was right there, right? Uh, and in one of them specifically, I saw him, and I think it was the third play of the game, run a defensive line game, and he took the guard that ended up picking him up, and he took him all the way right back into the quarterback. The quarterback gets hit by that guard, and, and then it kind of gets cleaned up from the other side as well. And he didn't get credited with the sack, so statistically, he didn't do anything yesterday, right? But he did have that play, and then he had another play where he ran a defensive line game. This time, he went first on the game with Adam Butler. And Butler ended up getting the sack, but the impressive part to me was the fact that he went full speed into the guard and he put that guy down. He smacked him as hard as he could, which opened it up for Adam uh, Butler to, to clean it up and get the sack. 
So Malcolm Kuhn's help cost two sacks yesterday, right? Uh, disruption's a, a much more important a stat for me than actually getting sacks. And I'll give you guys a quick example. Not a knock on Yannick Nkakwe, but if you guys go look at his sacks from this past season, he had a lot of sacks. They weren't real sacks. They were just cleanup, right? And to me, that doesn't really count. And and that's why you can look at a guy like Yannick Nkakwe and, and realize why he barely just got to an NFL roster. Even though you'll say he had eight sacks last season, more than half of his sacks were just cleanup sacks. Right. And I'm not taking a shot at him. I, I like him as a player. Right. I'm not taking a shot at him. I'm just giving you guys an example that comes to mind for me. Uh, Malcolm Coons caused two sacks. So even though he doesn't have the sacks, the coaches are running these defensive line games. They're running this to, to generate pressure, to make it hard on the quarterback. And it's working. And he was a big part of that. Right. Another big winner from yesterday's game. And this guy absolutely crushed it was and we can just get right into both guys, actually. It's the second year defensive tackles. Uh, both Neil Farrell Jr. and Matthew Butler to me look really, really, really good. Now they are completely opposite players. We know Matthew Butler is Matthew Butler. He's a pass rusher. He's a guy that's going to kind of get after it a little bit. Neil Farrell is a run defender. Let's talk about it. Uh, one play that stuck out to me with Matthew Butler was he got a little bit of penetration, almost got to the quarterback. They didn't actually get the sack, but he was doing this on a, a few different plays or a few different occasions. Now, I should also say this before, you know, this goes past my mind. One of the things with Matthew Butler is he was kind of playing late into the game. And when you get late into a game, you're not playing with starting caliber players anymore, right? You're playing with guys that are UDFAs. They're drafted as rookies. They're guys that, you know, have been around the NFL maybe one or two seasons. They haven't made it yet. And they're guys that aren't likely playing in the NFL. Neil Farrell Jr., on the other hand, started with the ones. He was out there. And he may not have started directly with the ones, but he was playing early on in the game when the veterans, the seven, eight, nine year veteran offensive linemen who are fighting for a roster spot were out there, right? Neil Farrell was having success against those guys. And a play that comes to mind was a fourth down quarterback sneak by Sam Darnold. Neil Farrell blew it up, right? Another play, the drive right before third and one. Neil Farrell takes his guy, pushes him right back into the running back, and he didn't technically make the play, but as a run defender, which is exactly what Neil Farrell is, that shit's important right there. To be able to crush the guy lined up across from you, to take him and take his ass right back into the quarterback or into the running back to reset the line of scrimmage, that stuff matters. And Neil Farrell looked very, very impressive. In fact, Neil Farrell looked a lot better to me yesterday than Matthew Butler did. That's not a knock on Butler. I think he had a good game in himself. I think he was a winner based off of what I wanted to see from him in terms of his pass rush ability, his pass rushing from year one to year two. He looked much more explosive, and he is more explosive than Neil Farrell. There's no question about it. Right? I just think that when you're relying on pass rush as opposed to when you're relying on run defense, as Neil Farrell is, if you're a run defender, you're going to play a little bit more because I think there's a lot of first down situations. There's a lot of run down situations. And when you're a pass rusher, you can't play on some of those downs. So it really limits you as a run defender, right? Now, obviously, if we're playing the Kansas City Chiefs or uh, a different team that may like to air it out a little bit more, you may see Matthew Butler in there a little bit more, right? But that's not most teams. Most teams would rather run the ball before they throw the ball because most people don't have Patrick Mahomes, right? All right, you guys, let's go ahead and jump forward into the next player that I really, really liked yesterday. And this was a guy that way outperformed my expectations of him. Uh, that is rookie linebacker Amari Bernie. Uh, 27 snaps yesterday. The guy had a sack. He had an almost interception. I know it doesn't count, but an almost interception to me is still an almost interception. Uh, Amari Bernie looked very good yesterday. And I want to see him continue to develop what we saw yesterday, right? Because to me, when you look at a guy like Bernie, you think of a guy who in college was a safety converted to linebacker in college, came to the NFL as a linebacker, and he got drafted. He's not a UDFA. He's not, you know, uh, the final pick in the draft. The guy got drafted to play for the Raiders. He went to, he, he played for the Florida Gators. The guy's expected to play and contribute for the Raiders, and he looked pretty good in his very first preseason game. Like, he was hitting people. He was hyped up. He was getting after it, and that is what I want to see. You know, one of the things I noticed yesterday with the Raiders is the energy was, was, way up here and i had never seen that with the raiders all the time that in the last couple of seasons i've i've watched raiders football the energy's been down here right not yesterday guys were out there hitting guys out there 
screaming and playing and wanting to get after it. Even Darian Butler, the other linebacker, second year linebacker, was out there making plays, right? To me, that's what I want to watch. I want to see guys get after and hit people. And Amari Bernie, for me, really, really stuck out. Now, he did have the dropped interception. Um, and I, I don't think, you know, his interception that was dropped was similar to Duke Shelley's. And we'll go ahead and get into it. Duke Shelley's another winner for me. Um, the difference with the two dropped interceptions between the guys was Duke Shelley made a read. He made a really, really nice read. He recognized it. He sprinted as the quarterback was getting ready to throw the football. And he got right in front of it and he dropped it. Mari Bernie was just kind of standing there and the quarterback threw it directly to him. Um, and to me, there are two different things, but Bernie looked very, very good yesterday in his, his snaps. Duke Shelley played 16 coverage snaps. He also looked very, very good. He looked comfortable. Um, and to me, that's, that's kind of what I want to watch, right? We heard about Shelley this entire offseason, how this guy's very good, why Vikings fans wanted him, how apparently he had some, some good reps against some of the, the better receivers out there in the NFL. And if Duke Shelley can come to the Raiders and have some success, I think going forward, we're going to be very good and very deep at that that corner position. Guys like uh, Marcus Peters and Nate Hobbs and Duke Shelley and maybe Tyler Hall, maybe it's Corey and Bennett, maybe it's, you know, whoever else it is. We're deep as hell, right? So for me, I'm really looking forward to seeing how the Raiders kind of continue to progress. Uh, so, so far, we got seven winners on the offense and now i want to switch over and get into some of the losers uh, we will start right here with Thayer munford now i don't think munford was the biggest loser at all um in fact i wouldn't say there's a biggest loser among any of these guys but i say Thayer munford because for me the thing that i i watched munford last season that i said this guy has to get better at is his mobility it's his movement right he has to get faster and quicker he did not do that he still looked slow Right. And the Raiders are a power based scheme for sure. And they may not care and they may still uh, start Munford at some point and they may still like him as he continues to get better. But to me, as someone who analyzes offensive line tape and I'm not talking just about Raiders, you know, I have a whole football scout channel. Where I break down O line, D line. The guys that have the most success are guys that are athletic, guys that can move the Colton Millers, right? The Tyron Smiths. Those guys that are athletic always have the most success. Rashawn Slater, Panay Sewell, just the, the list goes on and on. And the Thayer Munfords don't have success. There's two good examples of that. You got Trent Brown and Orlando Brown Jr. Although those two guys are like, you know, among the guys that are, are you know, massive, they're a little bit slower. Among those guys, those are the two best guys. They don't tell you about the stone four seeds of the Seattle Seahawks or the Daniel Fallel of the uh, Baltimore Ravens. Those two guys are in the same bracket as Stater, Munford, Trent Brown, and Orlando Jr. Those two guys don't start, right? And those two guys aren't very good. But we've seen even Orlando Brown and Trent Brown, right? We've even seen those two guys struggle. And they're bigger offensive tackles that aren't quick, but they're stronger, similar to Thayer Munford. I don't think Munford's going to have a whole lot of success. I, I just don't. And it's because he's not fast. He's not quick. You know, power is one thing and power is great if you're a guard, but Munford's not a guard. And there's a big difference between playing offensive guard and offensive tackle. Guards play in a small amount of space. Tackles play in a wide amount of space, right? So your guy has to be fast. And yes, if Munford has to come in for one game and start, you can scheme a, a scheme around that, right? You can put a tight end on his side. You can chip on his side. You can have a true double out of the backfield with the running back on his side. And that's great for one game, but when he's going up against Nick Boza, Joey Boza, Khalil Mack, uh, Chris Jones, and all these other defensive linemen out there that he may go up against, are we going to continue to chip and have our scheme so dependent around Thayer Munford? It doesn't make sense to me. Now, I'm saying all that, you know, he, he looked, he did look good in a certain aspect. He looked more physical, right? He looked more willing to hurt people. And on in that aspect, I, I could like that, right? And I could see him having success. And I could see the Raiders mentally saying, hey, this guy wants to hurt people and maybe play him. But I'd be very, very surprised if Jermaine Lenore does not start for the Raiders. And I'd be very, very shocked if the Raiders let Dalton Wagner just flat out lock and they cut Mumford instead of Wagner. To me, I think we're going to keep all of those tackles, right? I think Illuminar is pretty much locked in for the roster. I think Munford is kind of locked in for the roster as well. Um, 
But with Monford never say never on possibly cutting him and getting him back on the practice squad, right? He was a seventh round pick. That's not a major investment, especially if you think Dalton Wagner is better. And I don't like to say this, but I almost think Dalton Wagner, at least from one preseason game, and it's only one game, and it's not against first string guys. Always keep that in mind. It's not the first string guys. Things change real quick when Nick Bozas lined up across from you and wants to whoop your ass, right? I almost think Dalton Wagner looked better yesterday than Mumford did, right? And that's still an early analysis. I'm going to go back and rewatch the tape twice to really understand if, if, if that is fact. But Dalton Wagner looked really, really good yesterday and Theron Mumford did not, right? Let's get into the next loser. If there's a biggest loser, this is it. For me, this is disappointing to say, but I'm going to say Zamir White. You know, I've, I've almost hyped up Zamir White on this channel for the last, you know, couple of months based off the reports. You know, he's strong as hell. He looks bigger. Uh, we even got training camp updates recently against the 49ers. And maybe things will change when the ones are out there. Maybe Zamir White's more comfortable with Colt Miller and, um, Andre James and Jermaine Illuminor and Austin Hooper and, you know, Jacoby Myers and Hunter Renfro blocking out there downfield for him. But he didn't look comfortable yesterday. And another thing to kind of keep in mind, you know, one of the things with, with Zamir White is, you know, 3.3 yards per attempt isn't good enough. 13 carries, 43 yards. He got stuffed once on fourth down. Now the Niners way overloaded the box, you know, and that's going to naturally happen when you have too many guys there. The tight end got blown up. But regardless, it just didn't look good, right? He wasn't making people miss. And for me, that's the big thing. You got to make people miss. If Zamir White can add that part of his game, because his vision's fine. I know some people were complaining about Zamir White's vision. I don't have an issue with his vision. I think even with Josh Jacobs, some people overrate him a little bit in the aspect that they think like his vision is just like outstanding and it's like the greatest we've ever seen. I think there's a lot of running backs with great vision. Saquon Barkley has great vision. Nick Chubb has great vision. Derrick Henry has great vision. We're going to get like three rookies this year that have great vision. Great vision, if Zamir White doesn't have it, doesn't mean like Josh Jacobs, the only guy that has it, right? Out of, you know, if you get 15 running backs that come out of the draft, you'll get like four to seven guys that have great vision, and that'll be productive running backs. Um, Zamir White may not be one of those guys, right? We'll see. I didn't find an issue with his vision, but I did find an issue with his ability to make people miss one play specifically. Um the offensive line and the scheme is, is its own thing. We'll talk about that in a second. But the O line and scheme got Zamir White open. He hit the gap. It was him against, I don't know if it was a safety or a corner. And he got hit at like the three yard line and he couldn't, or maybe it was like the two yard line. And he couldn't score on that play. They had to give it to him on the very next play. To me, you got to make a guy miss. You got to lower your shoulder. You got to go through him, right? And you got to score a touchdown because the worst possible scenario is, is Zamir White versus a corner or a safety. He doesn't make that guy miss. You get stopped at the one, and now you're not able to punch it in, and you're settling for a field goal from the one-yard line when all Zamir had to do was make one guy miss. Because I can tell you guys right now, if that was Josh Jacobs, he would have ran that guy over. Fact, 100%. Can't deny it. Um, Josh Jacobs is a lot better right now than what I saw from Zamir White yesterday. Now, I do want to state this as well, right? Zamir White had some nice runs. Nine yards, six yards, five yards, four yards. And the thing with his runs where it was the offensive line and it was the Josh McDaniel scheme that was opening those runs up. And Josh Jacobs got those same yards last season as well, right? It's not like it's only unique to Zamir White. And I've been saying this and I'll continue to say it. The Josh McDaniel scheme, McDaniel scheme is fire. It is a very, very good scheme. It opens up lanes. You get receivers to get downfield and block and you make the plays look similar. You make them look the same with your play actions and it's hard as hell to stop and there's a reason why the Raiders had a lot of success last season right if the Raiders won some games at the end of the year if the defense came up bigger if the offense came up a little bit bigger we win more games and it was because of the Josh McDaniels scheme and I say all that because yes Zamir White may have more success as we go forward maybe he's better with the ones we heard the reports coming from um we heard the reports coming from camp right Zamir White crushed it when he was with the ones when Zamir White was running with the ones against the San Francisco 49ers ones he had big runs he had touchdown runs that were like 40 50 yards so it's not like what we saw yesterday from Zamir White is what we'll see going forward right especially with some of the like the one yard runs where he wasn't able to make people miss 
Um, plus, you do got to also keep this in mind. These guys practiced against each other for two straight days, and day three was the real thing, right? When I say practice, they scrimmaged against each other. So the, the, the Niners had already seen Zamir White for two straight days. How much does that factor into it? I don't know. But what I do know is Josh Jacobs last season looked a lot better than what we saw from Zamir White yesterday. And I'm not, keep this in mind for context, I'm not out on Zamir White, but you know, I'm also a realist. I also want the Raiders to win football games. And if Josh Jacobs wants $12 million, what the hell? Give him the $12 million. You're already paying Hunter Renfro 13. Who cares that one's a running back, one's a receiver? You're going to get a lot more production out of Josh Jacobs. Cut Hunter Renfro, get rid of him, get, you know, get out of his contract, whatever it is. Give him away for a seventh round pick if that means you bring in Josh Jacobs. Now I'll give Zamir White one more game. Hopefully we get the first string offensive line and hopefully then he'll change my mind. Um, so stay tuned on the Zamir White update. Something could always get updated. Uh, I think another loser for me was, uh, Byron Young, the Raiders rookie defensive tackle. Now, to be fair, Byron Young, what was, he was on there on the field for the very first play of the game and he doesn't have as much practice reps as some other guys. Um, you know, Zamir White's been there from day one. Aiden McConnell's been there from day one. Malcolm Koontz has been there from day one. Byron Young just returned about two weeks ago. So you do have to kind of understand from that perspective that he may not have had as many reps and he's a rookie. But so many reps, 17 total reps, so many of those he did absolutely nothing. And for me, as a guy who was a very, very, very high draft pick, I need to see a little bit more. Now, he looked pretty good against the run. Uh, he had some good reps where he was able to push guys back. But for me, the big thing is his, his pass rush was not there. It, it was non-existent, in my opinion. He got doubled a couple times. But even when he was in single blocking block situations, he didn't look great, right? And I think for me, with Byron Young, I need to see more. And I do expect to see more, right? I don't expect him to continue to, to not you know, have the hand-to-hand -hand technique, not have the pass rush ability. I, I think he'll definitely develop that over time. But he was a loser for me from this first preseason game. Now, there you guys have it, the winners and losers. And I should just give one more shout-out. It's not a loser. Uh, we'll give it a neutral rating, right? He could have been a winner. He may have been a loser. And that was Trey freaking truck, uh, Tucker. Trey Tucker looked good yesterday right and unfortunately he had two massive drops both on third downs both forced us to one settle for a field goal one to punt the football away had he made both catches he would have had two two more catches for 60 yards uh in the column dropped the perfect pass to him down the left sideline he dropped it uh third and seven we would have picked up at least six yards maybe the seventh yard possibly as well quick slant trey tucker dropped it you gotta make those catches if you're Trey Tucker. Now, again, it's not a big deal. He's probably nervous. Very first preseason action, but he got open a couple times. He was able to create separations, and it, for that reason, you know, I'd say he's almost a winner because of that. He was able to create separation. The speed flashed. I'm actually very excited for what the Raiders have actually done. You know, I definitely see the vision. I definitely see the plan. If our coaching could just continue what we've seen so far, because I think the biggest difference from last year to this year is our coaching with some of the depth players, with some of the guys that want to be great, right? Um, and I don't know if the leadership at the top of the Raiders have has changed and maybe that's impacted us a little bit, right? We got Jimmy Garoppolo on one end, Marcus Peters on another. Max Crosby has slowly gotten better and better and better, and he was great last year, and people respect the hell out of him. I don't know what it is, but this Raiders roster and team has a different feel to it, has a different energy, and I'm very, very fired up for it, and I'm 100% here for that as well. Let me know what you guys think in the comments below. I hope you guys enjoyed this video, and I'll see you guys next time with another video.